Whiskey, old girl? I'll have my usual, please, Dennis. Mm -hmm. One extra sour coming up. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, now, Dennis, I finally decided to write that bestseller. Why ever not? If Geoffrey Archer can do it, anyone can. I've got all the ingredients. Sex, power, money, corruption in high places. But I'm still short of a title. Yeah. Um, how about Margaret Thatcher, an autobiography? Dennis, <laughs> that's perfect. Weekending presents A Decade of Dominance, or The Labour Party, My Part in Its Downfall. A look back at the last ten years of Margaret Thatcher, featuring Bill Wallace, David Tate, Sally Grace, John Glover and Chris Emmett. I can see it now, Dennis. This book will be big. I'll have to think about merchandising, film rights, badges, baseball caps. Oh. Maybe they'll even serialise it on Radio 4. Oh. Tonight, Radio 4 Theatre tells the story of how upper-class MP Maggie Doolittle rose to be a humble Prime Minister thanks to the lessons of Professor Sarchi. We proudly present the new Pygmalion, or Mayfair Lady. Scene 1. A comfortable room in the Professor's mansion. What an incredible curiosity, Professor. Uh, yes, O'Keefe, those acts really crack me up. You and know the me? accent, so uncommonly snooty. Do say something for us, Maggie. I'm against hanging trade unionists, at least in theory. Oh, and the extremism, incredible. You know something, though, O'Keefe? Yeah. Give me a year and I could make her Prime Minister. Never. Oh, didn't I tell you public relations could make Anthony Wedgwood Ben seem human? Yes. Yeah, well, we all make mistakes, but uh, I still bet you I could make her Prime Minister. All right. A year's subscription to the Tory party. You're on. Time passed and Maggie learned quickly. Hello, mate. How's the pigeons? You going down the boozer for a pint? Hello, mate. How's the pigeons? You yeah, going... Yeah, all right, all right. That's enough of factory visits for today. Uh, you put down the calf. <sighs> Now, it's time to practice denying you're an extremist. But I'm not an extremist. Very good, but try and keep a straight face. A bit more working class, you know, look like you're a little bit more human. Oh, but I am. I've had enough of all this politics. I've had enough. Was that all right? Soon there was an election which gave the professor a chance to try out the success of his hobby. Tonight, to outline my economic policy, Vince Hill and Lulu are going to sing Pennies from Heaven. I must admit, Professor, you've done a great job. Her clothes are more modern, her voice is softer, her policy... In fact, I'm not sure what her policy is. Yeah, you see, I've succeeded there as well. Telling people what her policies are could lose any election. And, you know, she does seem so spontaneous. Yeah, it took me months working on that. But, Professor, don't you have any qualms selling her like, like, well, like soap powder? Have you seen the profits Lever Brothers are making? A week later, the bet was decided. Well, do I win, Sir Keith? You do indeed, Professor. <laughs> there she is. Reasonable, approachable, the heart of moderation. But, Professor, has she really changed? Not bloody likely. Dennis's diary in number 10, where, in her day of triumph, Maggie begins a clean sweep and Dennis is left to hoover the carpet. <sighs> well, what a three weeks. All those jostling, pushing crowds following Maggie around. <laughs> but at least the public relations men kept the voters away. We had quite a party in Smith Square last night, though that terrible Boyson man got carried away again. And, you know, even Lord Thornycroft was livelier than I've seen him for ages. I would have sworn I saw one of his eyelids move. But, oh dear, Geoffrey Howe heard I was an economist and trapped me in a corner to explain his policies. I think, actually, he'd had a few too many. It was totally incoherent, though Maggie said he'd been on nothing but the South African orange juice. I think, all in all, it was a good job the Champers ran out early, though Ted, you know who, got some black looks when he said it was probably the first of many shortages. He perked up a bit when Maggie mentioned giving him a job in the Foreign Office, though I have a feeling Ambassador to Peru wasn't quite what he had in mind. Anyway, after everyone left, there was quite a mess to clear up, and it was so nice to have Carol home. We needed another pair of hands to pick Willie up, and it was her who persuaded Maggie that she didn't really want to get Jim out of number 10 at four in the morning. We went round there about 11 in the end, and Maggie immediately got down to business and gave Audrey's curtains to the gardener, to burn. And then the telephone hasn't stopped ringing. At the moment, 
I can hear Maggie laughing hysterically upstairs. It must be David Steele with another offer of a coalition. She's in a very merry mood this morning. I only mentioned something about how she can start doing what she promised, and she gave me a very sinister chuckle. <laughs> I wonder if in number ten I can get someone else... Dennis! Dennis! ...to make her oval to him. My triumph has been unsurpassed. I've proved I can win all the prizes. But now you'll discover at last I do as my party advises. For a minister always survives by keeping his leader in check. And you'll see them all sharpening knives whenever I stick out my neck. A lady surrounded by men must always observe their decorum. Or I might lie inside number ten like Caesar lay there in the forum. But I know in my heart I'm the one who can get Britain out of this mess. And I'll tell you how I'll get that done. Well, that's if the others say yes. Once again, we present Dennis's diary. This week, there's a split in Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet, and Dennis gets the blame, because he'd been practising his golf shots in the kitchen. I tried to toddle off for a break in the country last weekend and practise my golf. The only irons I've been getting hold of lately are Maggie's, to press the shirts. But anyway, the hotel down there wouldn't believe I was Dennis Thatcher and lived at 10 Downing Street. At least, not till I showed them the bruises on my shin. What was worse, uh, when I came back, Maggie wouldn't really believe I'd been playing golf, so I got a few more. I'm not surprised she gets her way in cabinet meetings. Mind you, this week there was quite a palaver. Never heard such a furious argument, and that was just over whose turn it was to hold Sir Keith down. Then they got down to politics, and it was one view, then another, then the opposite, and that was just Willie Whitelaw's speech. But I reckon there was a real ideological split. I mean, there's some chaps who seem to want to sell everything to private enterprise and cut all social spending and take extreme measures against the trade unions, and that's only the right-wingers. Maggie keeps leaving articles around about the mass resignation of Jimmy Carter's cabinet, but Jim Pryor still hasn't taken the hint. Actually, it's not surprising old Mags was in a bad mood as she was so disappointed over capital punishment. But now she realises she must accept the general verdict against such severe sentences and she's decided to let off the Tories who voted no with a stiff warning. Anyhow, now she's concentrating on the banquet for our newfound European allies. So I hope she won't count the spoons quite as noticeably as last time. Actually, she did apply to use the state gold and silver plate, but they wouldn't let her, even though she pointed out her overwhelming mandate from the people. Anyway, it'll make a nice celebration for the end of this session of Parliament. No more Prime Minister's questions for another couple of months. Though, as she says, you can't answer much in 30 seconds, if you're clever. But, you know, it's a hard life. I sometimes think she was a fool to become Prime Minister. Uh, talking of which, we had this strange chap round talking to Maggie about filling Wembley Stadium full of water. Another Dennis. Poor chap. I hope his ankle heals. Anyhow, I'll tell you something I've decided. Next time Maggie shouts... Dennis! Dennis! ...for her Ovaltine, I'm going to nip out and go down the local and pretend I didn't hear. I say, where are you up to, old girl? I've just got to that stage when I had the full backing of British industry. Ah, yes, I remember. A Tuesday, wasn't it? We, in the CBI, are entirely behind Mrs. Thatcher's eminently sensible economic policies. Hooray! Though, unfortunately, they are leading to a massive recession. Ooh. But we don't give a lot of credence to all those economic surveys and prefer to trust in our own judgment. Hooray! Which also says we're leading to a massive recession. Mm. But we feel a cold douche in Britain would do no end of good to the economy Hooray! of Germany or France or Japan. Mm. We feel this winter Britain will be returning to the old wartime spirit Hooray! of everyone going around shooting each other. Mm. But... We will still offer our wholehearted support to a tough, practical and coherent Tory approach. Hooray! As soon as the Tories have one. Mm. We are not contradicting ourselves. Hooray! And neither are we. We present Dennis's diary. 
This week, Maggie announces more cutbacks, so Dennis is rationed to one Glenmorangia night. Oh, one world leader after another this week. But I'm really in the doghouse. First I mention Mao to Hua Go, what's his name? Then I tell my Hermann Goering story to Chancellor Schmidt. Well, I was glad to get back to Britain, I can tell you. Especially after that bill not to let husbands and fiancés go through immigration. But then there's so many bills going through Parliament, I can't keep up with them. First, Michael Thingy, you know, the blonde one, he's pushing ahead with plans to sell off government-owned houses to their tenants, and we can't decide between number ten and checkers. Anyhow, whatever else has happened this week... Oh, oh, yes, she really was delighted at being compared to Churchill by Chairman Hua. I expect she... Dennis! Dennis! Bring us the Ovaltine and we shall finish the job. Hmm. Not surprising she didn't get on with old Schmitty. Now, a lot of people have accused me of not having a sense of humour, most of whom are not laughing now either. But one thing I've never missed is an opportunity to stand up for Britain. Thank you, Rita. Not seen a snake like that in years. <laughs> uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, straight from the Whitehall Theatre, eh? Oh. Oh, the Prime Minister of Mirth, the Right Honourable Margaret Everyone a Winner Thatcher! Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. You know, I've been accused of lacking a sense of humour, but I just don't see the joke. <laughs> I mean, take my industrial relations. I wish someone would. <laughs> no one can accuse me of seeking confrontation. That's Jim Pryor's job. <laughs> and talking of disasters... Thank you, thank you. Some people see another winter of discontent ahead. Violence on the picket lines, oh. hospitals closed, oh, millions man. laid off. Off. But that'll only happen if we get the cut through Parliament in time. <laughs> <laughs> Explain it to her, sir. Explain it to her. Somebody needs to. No, no, but honestly, Mrs. Honestly, what I'm seeking is a truly classless society. And with the education cuts, classes should be pretty few and far between. <laughs> I love that one, I do. No, no, but honestly, to be truly serious for a moment, no, no, really, the Tory economic policy... <laughs> and there were also those who said I did nothing for the arts. So who was it got rid of Anthony Blunt, then? Good evening, and now for the next five hours we present a week-ending special investigation into the Blunt Affair. We trace Anthony Blunt to his secret hideout at a London press conference. We interview the author of a new book who believes that Sir Alec Douglas Hume is in fact alive. But first, Alex Johnson actually phoned Andrew McLean in his Moscow flat. Yes, yes, Robin, I'm, I'm actually phoning Andrew McLean in his Moscow flat. This, this is indeed his phone ringing now. It's ringing now. You can hear it ringing. He he, he doesn't appear to be answering it, but... Well, back, back to Robin. So, as once again Britain discovers a mole in the woodpile, a rat in the nest, we look back at the infamous career of Anthony Blunt. At Cambridge, he was one of the bright young men of his generation, a confessed communist who slipped his way through the rigorous security net of MI5 by filling out an application form. Arthur Walker met him many years later. He tried to keep it hidden, you know, but I, I could tell at once. The shifty eyes, the cocky exterior. You knew he was a spy? No, a Cambridge graduate. <laughs> Mr Walker, are you the fifth man? No. Eventually, blood confessed. But there is still controversy as to whether successive PMs were told. Harold Wilson, did Roy Jenkins tell you about blood being a traitor? Uh, Roy who? Jenkins. Never heard of him. Mr Wilson, are you the fifth man? Never heard of him either. Meanwhile, Alex Johnson is actually on the line to Andrew McLean in his Moscow flat. Yes, I'm actually on the line to Andrew McLean in his Moscow flat now, Robin. He, he's still not answering. In fact, I've been on the line for two hours now. However... Uh... Croydon 4501, hello. So back to you, Robin. Thank you, Alex. Are you the fifth man? No. The sixth man? Uh... The seventh man. Are you, in fact, the wicket keeper? We present Dennis's diary. 
This week, Maggie's in America, and while the cat's away, the mouse was left to catch up with the hoovering. <sighs> I rather wish I'd gone to America, actually. It sounded quite fun. I think Maggie must have visited Disneyland. At least she said she'd been talking to Goofy. I've been hearing about all the discussions. Apparently, President Carter was worried that the common market is discriminating against American goods and only offering them second-class status. So, Maggie's going to look into it and see if she can get Britain promoted to the same position. Meanwhile, she promised that she's going to increase spending on arms, take firm military action and meet aggression with aggression. But, unfortunately, the President didn't see eye to eye on trade union reforms. Actually, she was rather impressed with the way the Shah was welcomed over there. So if things do backfire on the industrial front, she'll have somewhere to go. <laughs> I really think, though, Maggie feels the President is rather weak and easily overawed by smaller countries. So she's hoping he gets a second term. Hmm. Still, enough of politicians. Lord Carrington also went along for the ride. He was out there to explain how his plan would bring peace to Rhodesia. Apparently, there were a few doubting Thomases at the talks, though she tried not to show it. Still, it's good to have Maggie back, I suppose. <clears throat> Except... Dennis! Dennis! She's got this terrible obsession about milkshakes. But most importantly of all, I always encouraged my backbenchers to speak their mind. <sighs> Just as long as the cabinet didn't, eh, old thing? Dennis! Oh, <laughs> Nice to have a confidence motion behind you. Yes, I certainly voted for her. Me too. Wonderful woman, Maggie. Doing a fine job for the party. Yes. And the country. Yes. Mind you, she'll probably lose us the next election. Yes, and wreck the economy. And foul up foreign policy. Yes, but a wonderful woman. Doing a great job. Full of guts. Mm, I admire that. Mm. Mind you... It's a pity she's such a walking disaster area. Uh, yes, but uh, doing a wonderful job, considering... A wonderful woman. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mind you... What? You're about to say, mind you. Uh, yes. Uh, mind you, I wish Heath had come back. Instead of Maggie. Wonderful woman. So is Maggie, of course. Doing a really fantastic job. Cocking up the government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, full of guts. Rather like a dead chicken. Mm, Stiff-necked, inflexible and frozen solid without a leg to stand on. On a good day. Shifty. Bullying. Naive. Arrogant. Incompetent. Yes, but a wonderful woman, isn't she? No. No, she's not really. You know, I think it's time to come out and say so. Yes, put our cards on the table. Write an article. Say exactly what we think. Yes. Whose name shall we put on it? Uh, order! Order! Mm. Questions to the Prime Minister. John Blundy. Order to ask the Prime Minister if she deplores the projected rise in unemployment to two million. I'm certainly not going to answer questions from a member of the government who doubled unemployment in five years. James Troutbridge. Does the Prime Minister feel that the decision to not offer further financial assistance to British steel... I'm sorry, I'm hardly going to take criticism from someone whose father was in the public gallery when steel was nationalised in 1946. Peter Worth. Is the Prime Minister intending to take action now the inflation rate has I'm reached... not going to answer a question from the party who left us with a 12% inflation rate. But I'm a Liberal. Well, I don't know how you had the gall to ask the question, considering your party passed the Great Reform Bill of 1832. David Hansen. About the lending rate increasing to 17%. I'm sorry, and but I'm a I... Conservative. Well, I'm certainly not answering questions from a member of a party which allows the lending rate to increase to 17%. But and who has bad breath and who eats their peas off a knife. End of questions to the Prime Minister. And I'm certainly not being told to sit down by some little jerk with a wig sitting in a big chair. And now, in place of the advertised programme, we present a look back at the achievements of the first year of Conservative government in celebration. Good evening. And tonight we're taking a look at the government's successes over the last year. Good night. May 1980. Trouble from violent, bloody extremists at the Iranian embassy. But sometimes you really do have no choice. You have to use the SAS. Oh, that's, 
We sure deserve this drink. Ah, oh, yeah, everyone out of that MS here makes you feel real good, eh? <laughs> oh, damn, I hope it's not one of those podgy boozers from Fleet Street. Oh, hello. Willie Wackle here. I suppose one out of two's not bad. Uh, hold it a moment, sir, will you, while we put on the balaclavas. Uh, I just called in to congratulate you chaps. I think, between us, we did an excellent job. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, look, come in. Of course, I've been in charge for all eight days. Uh, six days, sir. Six days, yes. Tricky fellows, these Iraqis. Iranians. Yes, Iranians. Now, if you just let me stand in the middle while uh, these chaps take the photos, uh, and perhaps, mm. uh, would you let me have this empty lager can as a souvenir? Oh, yeah, sure, uh, And sure. maybe you'd autograph it. Anonymously, okay, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll get it. Hello, the Prime Minister here. Of course, I've been personally in charge of the operation for all ten days. Uh, come in. And you've done an absolutely wonderful job. Yes, an absolutely tremendous, wonderful job. Hello there. Of course, I'd have been personally in charge of the operation if I'd been Prime Minister. For all 15 days? Exactly. Now, I've got Merlin Rees and the Shadow Cabinet out there, so I'll get them to form an orderly queue with junior ministers at the back. Come on, uh, Well, if you take the photo of me and the Cabinet first... Uh, yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll get it. Okay. Yeah. Can I keep this bootlace of yours as yeah, a memento? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Hello. Uh, 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 yeah, thank you, President Carter. Look, I want a bootlace as well, then. Uh, really? All 21 days? Look, come on in. A backbenchers over there, central office by the radio. Well, actually, I think Iran's a bit far for us to go, but thanks for the officer. Bye. Yes, and wait till when there's a Labour government, so we get some of the credit next time. What's up now? Uh, hey. You're not going to believe this, but there's this little guy with a long white beard and an Iranian accent. Then there was the first of many dear devoted cabinets, who even without my presence would always be hard at work grappling with some of the more pressing problems of state. Right. Look, while we're waiting for Mrs. T and the others, I should just like to say that this is probably the most important cabinet meeting this government has held. Oh, I agree, Sir Geoffrey. Thank you, St. John. I always look forward to the Derby sweepstake. No, I was referring to the decision of our economic policy, actually. Oh, that's all right. We've decided on 20p for everyone. All we can afford with the country and the state it's in. St. John, I'm referring to a serious matter. Sorry. A matter concerning the very lifeblood of this nation. Sorry. And which horse have I got, by the way? Hello, gorgeous. Oh, hello, uh, Sintron. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, no, no, not you, Willie. Sintron's organising some damn fool Derby sweepstakes. Well, if it's anything like how he organises the arts, he'll lose the money. Who have I got, by the way? Uh, Henbit. Oh, uh, Dennis Thatcher should have that one. What? Uh, sorry, nothing. Um, uh, I've been trying to impress on everyone that we've got a vital economic decision to make. Mm, 20 p is all I can afford with this inflation. Willie! Uh, did I say something wrong, sir? Hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, see you're all early. Uh, yes. uh, hello, uh, yeah, Prime yeah, Minister. Yeah. I've just been saying how very important today. Is. Yes, who is organising the sweepstakes? Uh, Sintram. Oh, God. Who have I got? Um, well? Heath House, actually. Oh. A bit of a no hope. You can say that again. Back to economic policy, I think. I'm afraid yours is a dead loss as well, Sir Geoffrey. Can we stop talking about this bloody horse race and start talking about the economy? I was, actually. When it came to relations with the trades unions, my door was always open. Yes. Hello, I'm Len Murray. We're expected at number 10, I think. What now? I think you've made a mistake. We're the TUC. Uh, we have an appointment with the Prime Minister. Oh, um, the TUC. So we are expected? Certainly. The tradesman's entrance is at the rear. Mrs Thatcher? Mrs Thatcher? We know you're in there. I insist you come out and talk to us. Hello, Mr. Murray. So pleased to meet you. Won't you introduce your colleagues? Oh, right, yes. Uh, this is Mr. Evans. So pleased to meet Mr. you. Mr. Bassnett. So pleased to meet you. Mr. Chappell. Hello. So pleased to meet you. Mr. Jackson. So pleased to meet you. Mr. Jenkins. How do you do? So pleased to meet you. And Mr. Scargill. Hello. Charmed. Now, about on a plot. Such a lovely meeting. Goodbye. By the end of my second year in office, unemployment was rising, factories were closing, and the inner cities were crumbling before my very eyes. It was all going far better than I could possibly have hoped for. And then he walked into my life. Yeah, it's funny. I could have sworn we met years before that. Maybe it just feels like it. Not you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. Him. <laughs> And now, the simple story of a man and a woman that has captured the imaginations of millions. Yes, it's... 
Margaret and Ronnie. The touching tale of how two star-crossed leaders found beauty and peace together and discussed ways of getting rid of them. As she looked round the now familiar surroundings of Kennedy Airport, what was left of Maggie's heart leapt in her bosom. How different this visit would be from the last. How different the man she was going to meet. Disillusioned with the fickle and flirtatious Jimmy, Maggie eagerly looked forward to the prospect of an older man. Someone more mature, more distinguished, yet not as grey. Odd that. Her tremble of anticipation when at last they met was followed by a glowing awareness that here was a man she could both respect and help. What you need, she said fondly, is a woman's touch about the place, but I'll do what I can. Charmed and fascinated by her words, Ronnie sat transfixed as she told him of the dreadful unemployment in Britain and how he could achieve the same. Yes, this is what he'd dreamt of, a twin soul, a kindred spirit, one who could share his thoughts if there were enough to go around. Uh, Ma'am, he said without wishing to seem too forward, I like your guts. Maggie blushed as he complimented her on her best feature. A look passed between them. Both knew what it meant, that though thousands of miles of sea divided them, their feelings would be as one till the end of time. And as they parted, Ronnie promised he'd let her know when that would be. And now a Conservative Party broadcast explaining their position on unemployment. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Still, never mind, eh? That was a Conservative Party broadcast explaining their position on unemployment. Summer 1981. The situation in the inner cities was getting progressively worse. And there were only two courses of action open to me. And as I didn't want to resign, I decided on a fireside chat to the nation. This one was recorded outside a burning building in Brixton. Good evening. The rioting that has ravaged Britain over the last fortnight has been truly tragic. The most worrying time of my years in office. And indeed, the reason I have spent many sleepless nights attending publicity stunts at West End theatres. But nevertheless, something must be done. Personally, I blame the parents. What are young children doing out on the streets? Why don't they do what we did and send them to finishing school? But as well as blaming parents, I blame political agitators. And I blame the media. In fact, I blame everyone except us, because I do feel very deeply that unemployment has nothing to do with it. And if it does, then I blame the unions for causing unemployment. After all, Chad has unemployment of over 15%, and they don't have rioting on their streets. They don't have streets, but that's by the by. Nevertheless, I do feel very deeply that the time has come to take positive action to end this wave of looting, stone-throwing and petrol bombing. For a start, we're putting up the price of petrol. Also, we're introducing measures that will get right to the heart of these areas' problems, such as water cannon and CS gas. And yet, the young and unemployed must not despair they must look on the bright side. They may have wrecked, looted, and devastated our cities. But just think, they have the ideal qualifications to be a Tory Chancellor. A big year for Australia. I paid my first visit there as PM. I was promised an interview with their top political commentator, but unfortunately, Skippy was busy that day. You're tuned to Channel 9, and this is George Negus in conversation with the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Good evening. Mrs Thatcher, firstly, can Unemployment, I ask... Unemployment? How dare you? Why must everyone persecute me over a lazy minority who won't fend for themselves? All right, but I... Of I'd... course I feel education's important. 
Why else do you think I send my children to private schools? Your children? What are... do you mean we don't get on? We're a close-knit, loving family. Has Mark been blabbing again? Uh, no, no. Oh, I... it's other people criticising me, is it? What have they been saying? Come on, out with it. I don't... I am not dogmatic. Anyone who says I am is wrong, and that's all there is to it. Look, And I'm... I don't like your tone of voice, young man. Now, will you stop bombarding me with questions? Well, actually, Mrs Thatcher, I was just going to ask about your defence policy. Oh. But after that, I don't think I need bother. Good night. What do you mean, good night? Turn the tape over, stupid! Chapter 2. When it comes to some of the trickier political issues I've been called upon to deal with, there are those who have accused me of being two-faced. No, there aren't. You keep out of this. I'm Margaret Thatcher. And I'm Margaret Thatcher. I've just condemned the cricketers touring South Africa. But yesterday, I said they were free to go. But at the time, I wasn't fully aware of the consequences, i.e., how unpopular I'd become. Nonsense. I have never courted popularity. So it's high time I started. There's an election in two years. I was merely voicing the nation's views. No one in his right mind approves of sporting links with South Africa. Dennis does. Exactly. Well, in that case, why didn't I do something to stop the tour? Because I mustn't spoil something so vital. Oh, yes. The freedom of the individual. No, our trade with South Africa. Oh, yes. I'm glad I thought of that. Ah, good evening, and tonight on the old serious chat show, I'm very pleased to have with me the Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher. Good evening. Well, Mrs. T, this is, of course, budget week, so I expect you can guess what I'd like to talk about first. Oh, yes, you mean Mark. Yes, uh, what? Well, it was a terrible ordeal, I don't mind telling you. Having a son stuck in the middle of the Sahara like that, it was awfully difficult to think of anything else. Yes, I'm sure it was. But on the subject of your old economic policies... Yes, now, that's a good example. You know, I don't think I read Milton Friedman at all that week. Ah, yes, monetarism. Absolutely appalling. Really? The heat. And then there's the flies, of course. Uh, yes. Well, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, I'm sure we all understand how terrible it must have been for you. Yes, it was. But I wonder if we could change the subject for a moment. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. That's all right. Honestly, to hear me talk, you wouldn't think I had a daughter, would you? Uh, what? Well, Carol's done remarkably remarkably well for herself. I'm very uh, proud of Mrs. her. Mrs. Thatcher. Answering questions on the radio like that, something I'm sure I couldn't do. Uh, you don't have to tell me. And now, the Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, will address the conference. Uh, 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 excuse me. Uh, uh, I'm not actually. Uh, for the owner of car GGL 426B to move it as it's blocking the entrance. Oh, needed saying, needed saying. Oh, uh, it's a Ford Escort. Oh, oh. Uh, there was a young lady of Ride who ate some green apples and died. The apples fermented inside the lamented, making cider and cider inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rhubarb, 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 rhubarb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're a load of grovelling toadies. Goodbye. And now, the Home Secretary, Mr. Whitelaw. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> During all my years in office, ten and counting, there are unpleasant chores that I've often been loath to do. Fortunately, sacking ministers has never been one of them. I think Norman St. John Stevens was one of my first, if not my best. I can still remember skipping merrily to the post box with the poisoned missive. Prime Minister? Ah, uh, oh, David. Uh, take a letter, please. Yes, Prime Minister. To that loathsome little toad, St. John Stavis. Dear Norman, <laughs> I deeply regret having to inform you... You're sacked. ...that I have decided, after long and painful consultations, to dispense with your loyal service. It was almost worth putting up with you for two years just for the pleasure of firing you. In your own way, you have been a most valued minister. You're a repellent little creep, And you. a dear friend. And I'd like nothing better than to walk over your grave. And if you find a suitable position in the future, I shall take steps to ensure you remain there. Up yours, Margaret. I hope that soon things will begin to look up. Yours, Margaret. Uh, letter for you, Mr. Stevens. Ah, uh, thank you, Nina. 
Oh, looks as though we'd better reply to Attila the Hen. Dear Margaret. I never realised quite what a cow you were. Thank you for your letter of January the 6th, Inst. I suppose you'll bring in one of your slimy little yes-men now. Naturally, I shall put my office at the disposal of a younger man. Who'll spend all his time licking your fundament. Who'll be better able to address himself to the centre of conservative political thought. I suppose with you as leader, you think there's a bright future for Britain. With you as leader, there's a bright future for Britain. Some hope of that. There's some hope of that, certainly. May you burn. I'm sure we'll continue to get on like a house on fire. And may misery be yours forever. Yours ever, Norman. Spring 1982. Do you remember, Dennis? Yes. Uh, 1982, wasn't it? The threat from the Labour Party had never been more serious. Yeah. Good job they kept Michael Foss on as leader, eh? <laughs> Celebratory snifter, old girl. Hmm? There you go. The Tory government offers Britain the opportunity for real jobs. Uh, a Labour government could offer a new pact with the unions to create more jobs. The Tory government is prepared to start the Channel Tunnel, thereby providing work for 12,000. The Labour campaign would take only five years to provide work for two million. The Tories are prepared to start work on a new channel bridge. That should take care of another 10,000. Uh, Labour's prepared to tarmac the channel and build a municipal community centre, giving work to skilled tradesmen and youth leaders. The Tories plan to cover the country's pavements in Harley floor tiles, thereby giving work to the whole nation. Labour will do the same, but after having built a, a, a replica of Britain, thereby giving work to two whole nations. The Tories will make it summer all year round. Labour will provide public holidays all year round, uh, in between building cross-channel community centres and replicas all of... All right, uh, the uh, Tories will give £10,000 to anyone who votes Labour for them. Labour will give £12. And a house in Isha. Plus a cabinet post. A life period. Uh, a donkey jacket? Uh, excuse me, Sir Nigel. Mm. Urgent signal from the Falklands, from the uh, captain of HMS Endurance. Well, what is it, Mountjoy? Hasn't he got rid of the Argentinian invaders yet? I'm afraid not, sir. In fact, it seems they're talking at the moment. But this is outrageous. They're nothing but a bunch of scrap merchants. Exactly, sir. And apparently they made a very good offer for the Endurance. And what with all these Navy cutbacks and redundancies... War, uh, I mean conflict, can be hell. But never let it be said that the British were slow to heed a call to arms. The Americans, yes. The British, never. Always ready to stand shoulder to shoulder. The Falkland Islands are and always have been British. I well recall turning to my then Defence Secretary, Sir John Knott, and saying, where are they on the map again? <laughs> Britain, 1982, and once again the might of Britain's navy leaves port with all the strength and tenacity it can muster. In hot! In hot! Excuse in me, hot. the Falklands. Is hot. it left at the boy? Destination, South Atlantic. Mission to safeguard the well-being of British subjects. Budget, 25 pence. And don't forget, I want that boat back in half an hour. Yes, 400 years on, the Armada has gone to a replay, and with some of the same ships. But they go into battle undeterred and armed to the teeth. In fact, with teeth. As always, the commanding officer is prepared to let the enemy put his case. Well, that sounds fair enough to me. What do you think, number one? Can't argue with that, sir. <laughs> yes, once again, we have successfully defended the empire on which the sun never sets. And so, as the sun sets slowly in the west, we pause only to ponder that age-old truth. Britannia rules the waves, but the Dagos have got all the islands. Hello again. And this week, down your way, comes from a sleepy and forgotten corner of the Commonwealth, the Falkland Islands. With me, I have a very hardy-looking member of the population who are said to be even more British than the British themselves. Hello, Juan. Hello. Oh, yes. Well, Juan, uh, I suppose you've been living here all your life. About two weeks, actually. Really? And what are you doing up on this high clifftop? Keeping an eye out for stray sheep? Uh, ships, yes. English battleships. Jolly good. And uh, do you enjoy life as a shepherd? No, shepherd. Me radar operator. Oh, jolly good. And what record have you chosen? El Gimno Nacional Argentino. Oh, jolly good. Well, before we play it, let's move on to Pepe, who's wearing a very smart khaki fisherman's smock. Ah, 
That's an interesting rod you've got there, Peppers. What is it? A Sarmalite submachine gun fishing rod. Jolly good. And what would you like us to play? I like to hear a song that brings back very happy memories for me. Uh huh, what's that? Marching through Georgia. Marching through Georgia? Say, South Georgia. Oh, that's jolly good, yes. <laughs> is that a joke? Weekending presents. Destination South Atlantic, an everyday story of warmongering folk. The story so far. British intelligence get hold of certain papers indicating that sinister Argentinian General Galtieri has invaded the Falklands. These papers, the Evening Standard and the Daily Telegraph, finally reach the Foreign Office, where suave aristocrat Lord Carrington flicks through an atlas and, after discovering that the Falklands are British territory, has a fit of embarrassment from which he never recovers. He and several of his aides disappear believed to be victims of a ghastly sacrifice ritual called carrying the can, forced on them by their ruthless boss, the mysterious Iron Lady. Panic mounts in Whitehall until it is discovered that Defence Secretary John Knott has somehow escaped slaughter. Then absolute panic breaks out. Knott decides to win back the Falklands and dispatches the Royal Navy, pausing only to borrow Lord Carrington's atlas and find out where to send them. Meanwhile, Al Haig, right-hand man of Wild West hero Ronnie Reagan, a close friend of the Iron Lady, flies to London, then Buenos Aires, then London again, trying to patch up the feud, but he makes little headway. No one can understand a word he says. Now, Galtieri, well-known scourge of communism and man of integrity, gets backing from Russia, while the Iron Lady condemns Galtieri as a fascist dictator and receives support from a renowned bunch of anti-fascists, the Chilean Junta. Meanwhile, Ossi Ardilis returns from London, revealing evidence that the British will attack in 442 formation, and penguins in Regent's Park Zoo send food parcels to their relations in the Falklands, now renamed the Malvinas. The post office is confused. Can General Galtieri use the crisis to divert attention away from his disastrous internal policies? Or will the Iron Lady beat him to it? Will she save her face? Don't miss the next thrilling instalment of Destination South Atlantic. Well, here on board the Hermes, security is obviously very tight indeed. Nevertheless, there is still plenty to report. At the moment, we're involved in a complicated naval manoeuvre known as floating. Obviously, I can't go into too much detail except to say that it involves water. At the same time, we are, of course, moving, and I think I can give you some idea of our position if I say that we've just left one wave and we're now coming up to another. In the night, we were joined by other naval vessels so that the task force now numbers well over one. And meanwhile, over on the horizon, I can just make out the horizon. This has been Simon Davis on board the naval task force somewhere at sea, heading somewhere else at sea. Whoopee! It's War Week in your explosive sun. Competition time. See if you can think up new names for the grotty gauchos before the task force makes hash of the corned beef cowboys and win a sun bulletproof t-shirt. Have you got what it takes to be a super slick, slimy dago slayer? Find out in our sun knockout quiz. Play Jingo Bingo. This week's prize, £30,000 of high explosive to be dropped on an RG of your choice. And on page three, blonde bombshell Belinda can't wait to get among the RGs. But don't worry, fellas, she's no junter's Judy. She's a Polaris missile, all primed up to create a few vibrations in Buenos Aires. And the sun says lynch those lily-livered labourites, quit cackling about compromise and kill the quizzling. Send a page special. While we're at it, which whops want wasting next? The sun takes a level-headed look at who should be next for a tough time from the task force. And if it means falling out with the Russians, let's make sure it's the right kind of fallout. Radioactive. Because next week, the sun sponsors World War Three. We now present a day in the life of Ian MacDonald, the Defence Ministry spokesman. At 7.30 yesterday morning, I was woken by my bleeper and went into the bathroom. For five minutes, I practised telling lies in front of the mirror. Can't seem to get the hang of it. Having weighed myself and carefully measured my tones, I descended the stairs. At 7.45, on a routine patrol of my living room, I encountered my neighbour's cat depositing a strategic outpost on my valuable Indian carpet. A total exclusion zone of two yards was immediately imposed around the mess, and the cat was ordered to withdraw. It refused. I then engaged the cat in tactical combat was inconclusive. There were no casualties. 
At 8 a.m., my bleeper sounded and I telephoned my mother who asked whether I had changed my underwear. I was unable to confirm this, but told her I would issue a further statement at noon. At 11 p.m., I withdrew to bed in order to read the complete works of Shakespeare. The mission was entirely successful. At 11.30, I went to sleep and dreamt of classified information which I am not at liberty to divulge. This concludes today's report. There now follows a party political broadcast on behalf of me. You know, at a time when so many lives are at stake in the South Atlantic, as Prime Minister, my main concern is naturally for the central issue of the whole crisis, BBC coverage. This week, Panorama presented the arguments involved in a totally fair and even-handed way. I was disgusted. Here we are, fighting for freedom, and there's the BBC doing just what it likes, subjecting us to the defeatist attitudes of an unrepresentative minority, or as they call it, news. Not content with that, the corporation has taken it upon itself to attack the two most valiant contributors to the war effort, the Sun and the Daily Star. These are crucial times. And unless the media gives its wholehearted support to the government's actions, we could be in severe danger of defeat in the next election. During the Falklands crisis, I took no prisoners. Sit down, Pim. Thank you, Prime Minister. You know, since I made you Foreign Secretary, you've maintained a level-headed approach and resisted the urge for warmongering. Thank you, Prime And it's no good saying you're sorry. Sorry? You see? There you go, trying to curry favour. You're so spineless. Yeah, but look here, and Prime what's Minister, this I hear about you wanting to negotiate with the Arges? Well, Prime Minister, once we've regained the Falklands, surely we'll need to talk things over. Talk things over? What kind of lily-livered rubbish is that? Well, Prime Minister, Francis, I don't see... do you want a permanent, peaceful settlement or not? Yes, of course. So, you admit it. Look, Francis, I don't think we're seeing eye to eye over this, so there's only one thing to do. Yes, Prime Minister, talk it over. Talk it over? I've told you, negotiations are out. Now, I'm sending a task force immediately to regain the Foreign Office from you, and I shall expect unconditional surrender. There now follows an important message from the Ministry of Defence. I have an announcement to make. On Tuesday, October the 12th, 1982, the Falklands Victory Parade took place. There were no casualties on show. And later on this evening, you can see the latest episode in Number 10, a drama series about the lives of British Prime Ministers. After looking at Gladstone and Disraeli in previous episodes, tonight we'll be going backwards in time to the days of Margaret Thatcher. Margaret, my wife and Prime Minister of England. Isn't it time some important political figure of the day dropped by? Well, James Pryor, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, is sitting in that armchair. Hello. Oh, so he is. But I did say important political figure. What is it, faithful butler? Ma'am, the servants are terrified below stairs. What is it, faithful retainer? They think they've seen a ghost. We are haunted by a horrible phantom. Oh, good. Norman's here. You mean Norman Tebbit, Secretary of State for Employment, dear? Of course. Show him in, Butler. Uh, he is being shown in, ma'am, by Mark. Our son and heir. Oh, well. Put the crumpets back in for another three hours. Oh, that must be my secret lover. You have a secret lover? Naturally. You know I am the central character of an important costume drama. I, too, am entitled to have someone who sweeps me off my feet and then kisses them all over. Show it, Norman Fowler, will you? Yes, tune in to number 10 tonight and see a slice of colourful pre-historical drama. Or, if you miss it, don't worry, as it's due for a repeat in 1984. 
The nuclear debate blazed furiously in the early 80s, and I eagerly awaited my first delivery of cruise missiles. Naturally, there was a full and frank exchange of views on both sides, CND putting their case and us refusing to discuss it. As I said at the time... Hello there, listeners. As you sit there at home watching your Brit oil shares crackling in the grate, you're probably a little worried. Worried about all this confusing talk about Mr. Reagan's nuclear missiles. Well, let me tell you, your fears are completely unfounded. He is simply channeling money he has saved on health and social security into America's flagging nuclear missile industry. Now, who could be more sensible than that? And who knows? This way, he might wipe out unemployment too. Yet, I still hear voices calling for unilateral disarmament. What utter nonsense this is. When these people go out, do they leave their front doors wide open for any Tom, Dick or Yuri to walk in and do as he will? Of course not. You know, my father had the right idea. He installed a special security device in his grocer's shop for when he went out. So, when a burglar did break in, 400 pounds of gelignite were detonated. All his possessions were destroyed, of course, but at least they weren't stolen. So, listeners, don't worry. Just think of the deployment of these missiles as a very generous first move by Mr. Reagan in strategic arms reduction. Because, really, the most efficient way of reducing the number of atomic weapons is by having a nuclear war. And if we do have a nuclear war, well, it's not the end of the world, is it? January 1983. I received a late Christmas present, an advance copy of the Franks report into the Falklands. It was far better than anything I could have hoped for. Even I believed it. Dennis let the cat slightly out of the bag, I'm afraid, by immediately mailing a copy to the Booker Prize judges. I'll never forget the frightened look on the face of the aide who first brought it in to me. Um, Prime Minister, the... Frank's report into the Falklands is here for you to read before it's uh, published. Uh, good. We must be careful to edit out references that might be of use to any political enemy of Her Majesty's government. Oh, uh, yeah. Like the Argentinians, for example. I was thinking more of the British electorate. Now, let me see. Oh, goodness gracious, that's got to go for a start. Um, that's the title, Prime Minister. But what kind of a title is the Frank's report on the Falklands conflict of 1982? It should be something like... A joyous celebration of our wondrous victory of the British armed forces in the Falklands under the inspiration of that modern Bodicea, the Honourable Member for Finchley. Uh, yes, of course. I I'll see to it. Now, page one. The government had been told by the Foreign Office weeks in advance that the Argentinians would invade. Uh, do you want to delete that, Prime Minister? Brown, we must not stoop to censorship. Uh, no. Just put, if only, in front. Oh, I see. If only the government had been told, etc., etc. Well, I'll leave you to do the rest, Brown, and if you find any adverse criticism of me in the report, you must have it underlined and reprinted in block capitals. Uh, oh, well, if you insist, Prime Minister. Oh, I do. And remember, Thatcher is spelt C-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. Yes, Mrs. C. I must say how very, very proud I am to be here in the Falklands. You've been absolutely magnificent. Uh, Margaret, dear, is that, I think they're penguins. I know, Dennis, but everyone here has played his part. Now, you people, I'm so honoured you've come to see me. Well, we're happy you're here, Mom. You did a marvellous job. Absolutely marvellous. You shouldn't say that. Oh, but marvellous. So softly. Say it louder and to this camera here. Dennis, can't you stop all these grateful subjects kissing my hand? But, uh, my uh, feet would be much more appropriate. May I just say how wonderful I am to be here? Now you, uh, tell me how you felt when the Argentines invaded. It was rather... A terrible experience. I know I felt terrible when I first heard about the invasion on the 31st of March, 1982. And who are you, young man? Uh, BBC, Prime Minister. Now, about the Franks report. I'm sorry, but I must go and speak to my penguins. And now, based on an idea by Roy Hattersley, this week's BBC Shakespeare presentation is... Lady Macbeth. 
The scene opens with the three weird brothers, Parkinson, Tebbit, and Fowler. Where, Where shall we three meet again? again? Right hold the house or number, number ten? By the plucking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Did somebody call? Hail to thee, Macbeth, that shall be PM forever. Now tell me something I don't know. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Oh, he has changed. What sayest thou, Fowler? I of Newton Tower Flog. Oh, so that's what you're putting in the hospital food these days. But Macbeth, beware Macduffel, the thane of Abervale. What? That poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the platform, then falls off. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Oh, so you've read my budget speech. Ah, banknote. What says thy husband? Drunken to this speech? Oh, him. Our damn spot. He is too full of the gin of human kindness to catch the clearest word. Ah, oh, is this a dole cue which I see before me? Is this what the weird brothers promised? Double, bubble, toil and trouble, unemployment's going to double. But when will all this be? Tomorrow, ah. and tomorrow, and tomorrow. What? Will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? And what is he that comes so withered and so wild in his attire? Ah, yes, um, hello. How do you do? Oh, lay off Macduffel, and damned be him that wants to start a scuffle. You don't scare me. Macduffel, thou shalt vanquished be when Burnham Wood doth move to Dunsinane. Oh, no, I knew it. I am undone. She's going to change the boundaries round again. But fear not. None that's born of man shall harm Macduffel. Then let the angel that thou still hast served tell thee Macbeth was from her father's grocery shop untimely ripped. Oh, no. I've blown it again. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Now, I want you boys to make it perfectly clear that we in the Tory party are the party of freedom and justice. Yes, Prime yes, Minister. And if people are jailed for leaking documents, it's because they've broken the law and not because we seek political revenge. Yes, Prime Minister. And above all, that these jail sentences are imposed by the judiciary who are independent and completely free from party political bias. Yes, yes Prime Minister. Right. Now, put your wigs and gowns on and get back to your courts. And now it's time for Today in Parliament, where for the first time we'll be hearing the so-called panic button, which some MPs have asked for to cut out any remarks they don't wish to have broadcast. And first of all, we'll hear questions to the Prime Minister. Dennis Healy! Uh, will the Right Honourable Lady tell us when she expects unemployment to come down? Well, I have no doubt that by the very latest it will be just... <laughs> And I'm sure that answers the honourable gentleman's question. A very successful intervention there by a government backbencher obscuring an embarrassing reply with deft use of the Tory buzzer. Well, the House will be pleased to hear that... Oh, wonderful tactics there as the Labour Party hooter is brought into play to prevent the Prime Minister announcing any good news. Tony Benn. Will the Prime Minister... And the Labour hooter again cutting off Mr Benn and curbing the risk of an own goal. Roy Jenkins. When is the Prime Minister going to... <laughs> Oh, and what's this? A, a bit of inter-alliance rivalry there, as the liberal klaxon interrupts Mr. Jenkins so that David Steele can speak instead. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. I, ah, I've just been told that it was not the liberal klaxon at all, just Cyril Smith sitting down. Michael Foote! Oh, oh, no. no. Will the right honourable lady explain? And, and, and I say this to the right honourable lady, and, and, and I, I, I say it... March 1983. Four! No, it was definitely three, Dennis. Another election won, and I didn't have to resort to any dirty tactics. I left them all to Norman Tebbit. It wasn't very long before he set about reorganising the entire party. Willie? Willie, where are you? It's Jim Pryor. Uh, over here, Jim, by the hot air blower. Oh, listening to your speeches again? <laughs> Leave it out, Jim. Sorry, Willie, we've been looking for you for days. Well, I dashed in here as soon as I heard the first result. Well, don't worry, Willie, it's good news. You mean we lost? No, we won. Oh, no. That means they'll give my job to... to... Uh... Hello, Norman. Talk of the tabby. Hello, gentlemen. So, it's a landslide, then. Uh, no, no, I just sat down a bit heavily. 
No, we've taken the country by storm. You mean stormtroopers? These new MPs are all ex-death. Now, now, Willie, you know very well that no one has done more than us to erode support for the National Front. That's right. Now they all vote for us. By the way, would you like to meet some of our new MPs? No. Oh, good. This is Norman Bland, our new Minister for Repatriation. Hello. Norman Blank, Minister of Compulsory Gym and Paternalism. Hello. Norman Bleak, Inner City Deprivation. Hello. Norman Blowtorch, Witchfinder General. Hello. And Norman Borman, Minister of Strength Through Joy. Hey! Hmm. What about defence? Oh, you must mean the war office. Here, I don't know any of these people. Where do they come from? A test tube at Porton Down. <gasps> Come on, boys, get to work. Uh, hey, what are they doing? They're just making a few changes around the place, and we'll start by dismantling the health service. No, no, leave those wash basins alone. And then no, we'll stop. sell off a few public assets. Oh, no, not the copper pipes. And now, what are we going to do with you two? Oh, no. First you, Briar. I think Maggie's got a nice new job lined up for you. Oh, good. At last I can leave Northern Ireland and come home to <laughs> London. <laughs> We're sending you to Port Stanley as new minister for the Falklands. Oh, no. Oh, Polly, that means Northern Ireland for me, I suppose. Oh, no, Willie. I've got something much more suited to your ability. Oh, good. There's your bucket. There's your mop. Oh. Now get cleaning. Oh, no! No! Chapter 3. Uh, not still scribbling in bed, old girl, shall I? Uh, just notes, Dennis. Early 1983... It was just about this time that I was accused of living in a fantasy world and populating my cabinet with dark, shadowy figures, creepy crawlies, and things that went bump in the night. Whoa. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Sorry, Maggie. Put the decanter too far away from the bed again. Oh, got it. We present The Tebbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, a mystical saga set in the fantasy world of Torridom. The Tebbit. In a hole in the ground, there lived a tebbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, but a nice, cosy, fallout-proof tebbit hole deeply dug beneath the Department of Employment. What is a tebbit? I suppose the tebbit needs some description nowadays, since it is very rarely sighted by ordinary people, largely because ordinary people hide in cupboards the merest hint of his presence. The tebbit has no beard. There is little or no magic about him, except the ordinary, everyday sort which helps him to make jobs disappear. He is inclined to be thin, and he tends to wear rather large shoes to encompass his furry little feet, which have grown naturally leathery soles from continuously peddling a bicycle. Just one other thing about the Tebbit, he talks something like this. I don't care about anyone else. I don't care about anyone else. I don't care about anyone else. One morning, the Tebbit was standing outside his Tebbit hole when Maggie Dolph came by. Good morning, said Maggie Dolph. She was wearing her immense black boots and looking a little weary after a night spent wrestling with mysterious runes and portents from the Central Office of Information. It's not going to be a good morning if you're going to tell me I've got to meet all those wretched little people from the Dwarves' Union Congress, said the Tebbit. But that's exactly what I am going to tell you, replied Maggie Dolph. And before the Tebbit even had time to comb his feet, two dwarves in little peaked caps rushed past him and into the Tebbit hole. Good morning, I'm Chapel Frank. Good morning, I'm Booked and Ray. In here, Booked and Ray. Right door, Chapel Frank. For a moment, the Tebbit looked altogether bewildered. But Maggie Delf, I'm the Tebbit, said the Tebbit. I'm not one to hobnob with dwarves. Not since the last time they came round and had the nerve to sit down. But another important dwarf was already arriving. Good morning, I'm Morella. In here, Morella, you'll be great, Morella. The poor little Tebbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands. A Tebbit shouldn't behave like this, said Maggie Dove. It's just a question of having a little chat and trying to set them on the right road to recovery. And Maggie Dove put a sinewy arm around the Tebbit and led him inside to join the dwarves, who were singing a dwarfish little song. Jumping and we sing a song, now in land where we belong. Here we stand, clapping hand, where on earth did we go wrong? <laughs> And as the dwarves sang, the Tebbit felt a great love overtake him, a pure and magnificent love of absolute power. 
and he felt a desire to move the very hearts of the dwarves. Exactly where he wanted to move the hearts of the dwarves, he wasn't quite sure yet, but it was somewhere far from his tebbit hole where they could find untold delight in the knowledge of a job well done, and their reward would be precious, precious little. I'll do it, Maggie Delph. I'll do it. Dear, dear little tebbit. But don't you wish for any reward for yourself? Power, 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 power. I can't quite put my finger on the word, but it's something like power. Will the Tebbit ever find time to comb his feet? Will Murray Len, Chapel Frank and Buckton Ray learn to talk properly? And should Maggie Dalf grow a long white beard? Find out soon and meet all the other elves, goblins and evil trolls of Torridom in Chapter 2 of The Tebbit. There she comes. So, uh, you tell her. No, 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 you tell her, please. Uh, Prime Minister, we've got some rather bad news. Oh, not more, Lawson. Not with Labour only five points behind us. Uh, but the Caribbean spice islands of Grenada, page 127, six degrees west, 12 degrees north, former British colony, now independent member of the Commonwealth, is about to be invaded by a foreign power. Oh, excellent. And not a moment too soon. Uh, what? Send for the Invincible and requisition the QE2. Uh, no, 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 Prime Minister. You've got the wrong idea. What's the matter, Britain? Oh. Don't you want to give the Arges another thrashing? Yeah, well, of course, yes, but but it's not the Arges this time. Well, who is it then? Oh, you tell her. Oh, you tell her. Oh, surely not the French. I've only just waved him off at the airport. It's not the French, Prime Minister. Or the Arges. It's the Americans. The Americans? Yes. Mm. What are you going to do? Uh, well, we'll do what I always do on important questions of foreign policy, Lawson. I'm going to ring President... Ri oh... Ah. You'd better ring him, PM. Tell him to call the whole thing off. Very well. Howdy. Unfortunately, I am unable to come to the phone at the moment, as uh, I'm supervising another madcap foreign adventure. If you wish to leave a message, please speak clearly when you hear the tone. What's he saying, Margaret? Uh, now, look here, Ronald. This invasion of yours is really a very bad idea indeed. Uh, but, of course, I may come round to your point of view eventually. So, that's fair enough, then. And, uh, uh, oh, thanks for the birthday card. Oh, well, I think you managed to put him straight on one or two points. What about public opinion here? How can we convince the anti-nuclear lobby that Reagan will consult us over the firing of the crews? Uh, well, he said, uh, he said... That, yes. Uh, Hello, everyone. What's oh. going on? Ah, Geoffrey, as you're the Foreign Secretary... Uh, am I? I'd like you to go into the House of Commons... And take all the sh... Oh, my leg! ...and explain the government's view on Grenada to Dennis Healy. Um, but I don't know anything about it. He, he, he'll make mincemeat of me. Geoffrey, from time to time, we all have to make sacrifices. Oh. And you can't have a sacrifice without a dead sheep. I have often been accused of being paranoid over the subject of government leaks, which, of course, is utter nonsense. But if I ever found out who told the press, I'll kill them. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just popping out for a minute, old girl. Ah, Willie, I've been expecting you. Oh, really, Prime Minister? Yes, I felt the building tilt towards the front. Oh, yes. Now, have they sacked the mole who leaked that defence memo to the Guardian? Oh, you mean the one that read, Dear Maggie, cruise missiles are on the way. Thought you'd like to know, Michael. That's it. Yeah. The traitor should get 20 years at least. Well, there hasn't been much chance yet. Oh. And uh, what did you want to see me about? Well, Pierre, it's about the publicity for the new financial estimates. They don't look too good, quite honestly, and I, I'm not sure how to soften the public up for more tax increases. Oh, well, we'll do it the usual way, will it? Usual way? You know, plain brown envelope to the telegraph. Or, if you prefer, you could let it slip over lunch with some journalist or another. Uh. Coming soon from United Conservatives in association with Metro-Goldwyn-Mail on Wednesday. The Evil Ted. From the people that brought you Danger, XPM, and In the Heath of the Night, a new horror to chill your wine. The Evil Ted. The story of one man's treachery, disloyalty, responsibility for World War II. And anything else we can accuse him of. Starring Ted Heath. 
as the sailor who fell from grace. With full supporting cast of 12 rebel Tories no one's ever heard of. Gasp as Ted leads his gang on a desperate raid on the government's credibility. Scream as they make their epic escape to the opposition lobby. Yawn as the pundits realize that no one could care less. More backbiting than the dogs of war. A bigger government majority than 2001. The evil Ted. In London now and all over before anyone notices. Certificate double chin. If this doesn't scare you, you're probably already red. So, Geoffrey, yes, how did these civil service unions react to you banning them at GCHQ? Oh, uh, they're absolutely livid, but I told them it was just a one-off. And did they believe you? I think so. Good. So, where's the next one-off? Well, I thought perhaps the naval dockyards in the foreign office. How about number ten? There now follows an act of desperation by the leader of the Labour Party. Imagine. Imagine a party political broadcast. Imagine a famous actress and a few passers-by making vague generalizations about defense. That won't be too difficult if you watched it, but imagine the problems we had dreaming it up. Imagine Tony Benn agreeing with Dennis Healy. Imagine me agreeing with either of them. Now, you might think the Labour Party is committed to unilateral disarmament, but that's only because it says so in our manifesto. Imagine it doesn't. Imagine we're just committed to peace, and anyone who says we've had peace ever since nuclear deterrent, imagine we weren't at peace. Yes, you need a lot of imagination to vote Labour. Imagine a shadow cabinet that's united. Imagine us winning the next election. Imagine it. I keep trying. Jenkin, what is going on out there? I'm afraid it's another GLC day of action, Prime Minister. They've shut down the schools, closed County Hall, even the fire brigades reduced to an emergency service. Oh, really? This is going too far. I say, that's my idea. I thought of it first. Will you stop it at once? By the summer of 84, I was entrenched in battle against the enemy within. And once I dealt with Ted Heath, I turned my attention to the miners. In Orgreave lies the scene where miners mass, all bent on keeping Yorkshire coke stockpiled. And 7,000 pickets plead their cause, while constables of England check the laws. They doth outnumber us, good Sarge. They doth indeed, but won't indeed outdo those deeds we do in dealing fair today. In daring deeds indeed, don't be outdone, for duty doth demand those deeds we do. Hmm, that's plain as my pickets pike staff, Sarge. False prating never was late to my charge. Ooh. Well, oh, charge, good oh, Ned. Thy pike staff struck his mark. Aye, John, but look, our leader's trapped. Our charge means naught once legal charge is slapped. Uh. Come on, my little ray of Phoebus light. Our block is highway. Move along and quick. No way, no way. You're way out there. No highway's blocked. Tis but an adult painted clown in the His foolish cabin megaphone proves all. I'll prove you megaphone. To jail! Oh, no! Why well, use it, he, that megaphone, think you? I'm horse, I'm horse. This thing's done for. I'm horse. His foolish art will fail, for tis decreed. Arthur is a foolish art indeed. Shut up, Wilkins. Sorry, sir. Thus, clown cap Scargill headed for the courts. And such a war at Orgreave then ensued. It made the siege of Troy or Bosworth Field seem but a scratch upon a riot shield. Thou poxy constable, lay down thy cush. Thou scurvy piggot, let those drivers through. Thy menacing approach we have not earned. Oh no, yon porter cabin's overturned. Such deeds were done indeed that did outdo the very deeds they dreamt of being done. As night fell, police and pickets checked their loss, but Augury Field left no one scoring points. And pointless tis to point a moral out. That war was fought. Tis peace that hangs in doubt. Uh, you wanted to see me, Prime Minister. Ah, yes, Ian. Now, how's the miners' strike going? It's none of your business. Uh, no, no, Ian, we're not in front of the cameras now. Oh, oh, I see. Well, as a matter of fact, it's not going too well. Oh, really? What's the matter now? It's NACARD. Uh, exhausted, Ian. The pits are exhausted. Uh, no, no, no. I, I meant the supervisor's union, NACARD. They're talking about a strike. But aren't they on our side? Well, they were, but then I decided to amend the agreement that says they don't have to endanger their safety by crossing picket lines. And what did you amend it to? Well, they do have to endanger their safety by oh, crossing picket lines. Really? Well, they can't go on strike without holding a ballot. Too many people think they can ignore democracy whenever it suits them. Well, they've already had a ballot and they voted for a strike. That's neither here nor there. 
Get in touch with the leadership and tell them we're prepared to back down if they overrule the strike vote. Yeah, but if I do that, it'll show Scargill our weakness. Oh, I see. Well, I told you before, Ian, the miners' dispute is none of my business. Uh, but I don't see any cameras. There aren't any. Now, join us as we pay tribute, tax and national insurance contributions to Margaret Thatcher, housewife, mother, supreme ruler and our Man of the Week. Margaret Hitler Thatcher served her apprenticeship under the grocer and was known for a forward looker by her habit of wearing blinkers. Swept into office by a wave of popular tabloids, she set about putting the country right wing, like so many great women before her. Like Boadicea, she went sacking in London. Like Elizabeth I, she screwed Essex. And like Victoria, she only serves Kent and the South East. For her policy of steering the middle way between fairness on the one hand and unfairness on the other has meant cutting taxes for the rich, cutting riches for the taxed, and redistributing wealth back where it belongs, with the wealthy. The whole package disguised by the greatest stretching of figures since the Spanish Inquisition. But instead of the economic miracle she's been banking on, it'll take a miracle of banking to save Thatcher and her toadies from the hole. And as she gathers more power to herself than Patrick Jenkin in a blackout, her Henry V-like speeches have everyone around her filling their breaches. Now, with the road for recovery closed for repairs and the road to Basingstoke, the only definition of M3 anyone still talks about, the blame for Britain's troubles must rest squarely with one individual, Francis Pym. So, raise your right arms and your overdrafts to Margaret Thatcher, artless, heartless and scared a lot, our Man of the Week. At roughly three o'clock, the bomb went off and clouds of dust made darkness darker still. On Brighton Promenade, some broken glass and shreds of wallpaper covered the cracks in the pavement. More police arrived to join their colleagues, waiters lost their surly smile, and firemen waved their ladders in the air to reach whoever might be trapped inside and dust settled over the Grand Hotel. The conference centre was right next door, handy for delegates, reporters and PR experts who could take a bath, then get to work in 30 seconds flat. But someone else had been to work that night, and now all stood together on the prom, some pressmen in bow ties, a minister still in his dressing gown, and policemen shepherding their charges through the dark. Is he safe? Has she been found? Thank God. But no one knows who may still be inside, inside the Grand Hotel, that Grand Hotel where comfort had been broken by the blast of something somebody has left somewhere. Business went on as usual that day. Speeches were made, ties straightened and brows mopped. But even while the final music played, all thought revolved around the Grand Hotel. That was no ordinary bomb, that blast. No democratic bomb, no honest bomb, nor any accidental bomb, that bomb. The Grand Hotel's facade was ripped away, its rooms exposed and open to the air, while somewhere out of sight and shaking still, an unknown man thought fondly of his bomb. Or rather, a device, a secret mass to secret ends, a 15-pound tripwire. After five years in power and with a three-figure majority, critics were beginning to accuse me of behaving like royalty. When the Queen rewrote one of my state opening of Parliament speeches, my husband and I were not amused. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, my government consider as their highest priority the maintenance of national security and the preservation of peace. <coughs> My government will contribute to arms control and disarmament negotiations. They will work continually for a greater atmosphere of trust between East and West. My government remains deeply concerned about unemployment and will continue policies designed to achieve better opportunities for employment. <laughs> My government will work for a <laughs> more flexible and competitive economy, which will <laughs> sustain rising living standards. <laughs> ah, martini, um, three parts gin, 
<laughs> now, just show it the martini bottle. Ooh, oh, <laughs> that's enough. Three more parts gin. <laughs> now, uh, another slug, Margaret? Oh, don't tell me John Selwyn Gummer's here. We present Banana Skin Patrol, starring Sue Pollard as John Selwyn Gummer and the EEC Butter Mountain as Viscount Whitelaw. Oh, I say, Gummer, are you leaving those chips? Why don't you shut your fat gob, you stupid, interfering old bird brain? Sorry. Uh, no, not you, Willie. I oh. was drafting my reply to this latest attack by the Bishop of Durham. Oh, yes, yes. The one who thinks we are out of touch with poor people. What rubbish. I touched three of them only last week. Oh. And you've refuted the Bishop's charge that we are living in a police state? Oh, I've done better than that. I've tapped his phone. Oh, you must admit that he's looking after his fellow man. Yes, when he ought to be sticking to Christianity. Mm, but... Isn't that what Christianity is? Not in my Bible, matey. Well, that's only because you ripped out the awkward pages. Uh, yellow alert, oh. yellow alert. Banana skin located in the Torres Shires. Full morale crisis in progress. Oh, it's Big Mag. <laughs> Into the banana mobile. No, not a two quid a gallon. I've got a much better form of transport that's economic, enterprising, and improved by Big Mag herself. Oh, no, not a Sinclair C5. Oh, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, why doesn't that flipping milk float get out of the way? Oh, give him a chance, Gummer. He's only just over tickets. Oh, this is hopeless. We need to get a morale-boosting message to the party faithful much faster than this. We might as well write them a letter. Brilliant. Uh, dear party worker, pull yourself together, you whinging little snob. Yes, uh, fine, but um, wouldn't it be better to cheer them up a bit hmm? with some good news about the government's record? Don't be silly. Where will we get that? From a newspaper. Rubbish. They're all saying the same thing. Unemployment up, investment down. Yeah, but uh, I've invented this really fool method for making any newspaper report reflect on the government really well. How? Simple. You just rearrange the words. Unemployment down, investment up. <laughs> Crikey, that's brilliant. <laughs> and another thing. Yes? You're sitting on my shooter. Sorry. <laughs> well, oh, that seems to have sorted that out. Yes, yes. The whole party's happily united. Mm. Nothing can possibly go wrong now. <laughs> Hello, lads. <laughs> oh, hello, Nigel. Good luck with the budget. Thanks, and I'm really grateful for the newspaper report you sent with your letter. It, what report? You know, the one with the glue all over it. What? It says how well the government's doing. <laughs> In fact, I've based my entire budget strategy on it. Stupid, great, fat, interfering, galumping prat! Writing to the Bishop of Durham again, Governor? No, Nigel, just shouting at Willie! Oh, uh, we won't do it. <laughs> And as I stand here before both houses of Congress, let me say how pleased I am that we've brought the Russians back to the conference table. For to thaw thaw is better than to snow snow. We will fight them with our speeches. And I say to you, give us the Star Wars technology and we will finish the job. Now, Britain's financial policy may seem a riddle, wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma, for never was so much owed by so many to so few. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and Nigel Lawson. But to budget, budget is better than to fudge it, fudge it, and we must combat terrorism, for to chat, chat is better than to rat rat. And we will have victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror. For without victory, no one's going to say, this was my finest hour. Oh, well done, Maggie. You don't think I overdid the Churchillian bit, do you? Oh, no, no, no. You want to put that cigar out? January 1986 was eventful, to say the least. I started the month by deciding not to have a helicopter pad installed on the roof of 10 Downing Street. The last thing I wanted was Michael Heseltine dropping in on me. Though I can see his fascination with the things. Like his career, they go straight up and then straight down again. Superman, Dante, 
Captain Galaxy, Batman. All right, Nigel, that's enough apologies for absence. Right. Let's get on with the cabinet meeting. Uh, yes, 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 Margaret, where's Michael? Oh, don't let's wait for him. Oh, I agree, Maggie, then we needn't bother about item two on the agenda. Good thinking, Leon. Item three. Yes. Oh, yes, see, 250 billion overspent on education. Well, that'll be Keith's medical bills. Sorry I'm late, everyone. Oh, Michael. I got a bill held up. Got halfway down the stairs at defence before I discovered that somebody had stolen them. Uh. Then, by the time I'd unbricked the front door, dodged the plane crashing on Whitehall and popped into number ten around the back to avoid the escape panther... Yes? It was five past nine. So, item two, uh, Westland helicopters. No, 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 no we're all no, bored no. rigid by your obsession. All right, then, let's talk about your obsession. Well, come off it, Michael. The cabinet don't want to hear about wrapperware. I do. Oh, no. don't be silly. I was referring to your ridiculous campaign to hound me out of office. Boys, boys, this has gone on long enough. All this arguing is very bad for the Cabinet's image. Yes, Margaret's right. We're beginning to look disunited. Worse than that, you're starting to look as if you're thinking for yourselves. Oh, what? So I've had a brilliant idea to stop this public wrangle once and for all. You jolly good, Becky. In future, all statements by ministers will have to be vetted by the Cabinet office. Oh, oh what? Well, yeah. That'll mean the end of our independence. Yes, I told you it was brilliant. But this is intolerable. I'm not standing for this. But it's starting to look better. If this is agreed, then I shall be forced to resign. Yeah. It's starting to look positively a genius. Uh, right. All those in favour? Uh, okay. 24. All those against? One. I meant it. Yes. Cheerio, Michael. I'm going. Uh, bye, Michael. Off I go, then. Bye. Oh, and Michael? Uh, yes, Prime Minister. You've forgotten your satchel. Oh, <laughs> oh, well done, Maggie. That's got rid of him. Uh, yes, Maggie, it was a clever idea of yours to force his resignation by pretending to increase your personal power. What do you mean, pretend? <laughs> I meant every word. <laughs> and you just voted for it, unanimously. Oh, oh, golly. i better catch Michael. What for? I put a black mamba in his desk. Well, he's probably oh. cleared it by now. I wonder how he's getting on. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hesseltine. Britain. How's everything? Oh, no hard feelings, then. What are you doing? I'm tidying up my desk. All right, so you've resigned. No need to cry about it. I'm not. I can't find my pencil case. Oh, you mean the one with the action man transfers? Yes, have you seen it? No. Oh, I don't see why you're so upset. You brought this on yourself, you know. How? In a word, Westland Helicopters. That's two words. That's it. Contradict me as usual. I bet if I said it's a nice day, you'd tell me it isn't. It isn't. No. I only want the best for Britain. Oh, I say, thank you very much. Not you, the country. I couldn't stand by and watch Westland fall into American hands. Why not? Everyone else in this country has. You'd better not let the PM hear you say that. Hear him say what? Mm. Hello, Michael. Having a nice day. Oh! Taking it badly, eh? He's been saying terrible things about you, Margaret. You little What boss. did you call me, Britain? Margaret. Oh, sorry, Prime Minister. Better. Only my friends can call me Margaret. You haven't heard your Christian name in years, then? What? But I thought I was your friend, Prime Minister. Oh, really? I don't suppose it's entered your tiny little head that Hesseltine's resignation is partly your fault. Ah. I don't suppose you realise, Britain, that all this nonsense will reflect badly on me and my cabinet. Oh, uh, uh, well, uh, actually, I've tried to patch things up between Michael and me right now, aren't I, Mike? Huh? Yes, I'm helping him look for his pencil case. Very good, Leon. Yes. And after you've done that, yes. perhaps you'd better get Michael to help you look for your pencil case. Of course, Prime Minister. I'd be delighted to... <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <clears throat> you've been a fool, Archer. Uh, yes, PM. You've caused me a lot of embarrassment. I'm sorry, PM. And you're sure there's absolutely no truth in the allegations? Oh, none whatsoever. In that case, Geoffrey... Here's two grand. Now get out of the country. Oh. Ah, Dennis. Yes, Turtle Dove. Do you remember the last visit to President Gorbachev? Mm. There were candlelit dinners. <laughs> we, we drank vodka toasts. Yeah. I'm so glad you weren't there. Then there was the ballet. Bolshoi. It's true, I tell you. I remember my very first words to him. Now then, Mr. Gorbachev, Maybe. before we get down to business, let me just say that the ecstatic crowds who have mobbed me at every step of my visit have been absolutely marvellous. Yes, yes, I also thought that the British press have been very well behaved. <laughs> now, Prime Minister, ah, 
Or can I call you Maggie? Of course. Let's dispense with the formal titles. It would be silly for you to say Your Royal Highness every time you spoke to me. Good, good. I was hoping that the tone of our private meetings would be informal, in fact. Why don't you sit here? You would be much more comfortable. All right, but... If I sit on your knee, you mm. promise not to get the wrong idea? Oh, what do you mean? I know what you Russians are like when it comes to taking liberties. Uh, well, it's true that we did take Sakharov's liberty and the Begun's liberty, but now we have given it back under my new policy of glasnost, whereby our people have freedom of thought and our dissidents have freedom of movement. And so do your hands, you naughty <laughs> man. Behave <laughs> yourself. <laughs> and talking of dissidents, mm. you really must stop sending your political opponents to Siberia. Yeah, but but what about the political dissidents in your country? Eh? Uh, quite so. I'd much rather send them to Siberia. Good, good. So, we have reached agreement on the human rights question. Now, what about the crucial question of redeployment? How dare you? You know I had completely forbidden discussion of that topic. I refuse to give way. You won't even discuss redeployment? Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you said unemployment. <laughs> yes, I've already agreed that we will redeploy several medium-range pop groups and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Excellent. Well, I think things have gone very well for your visit. Look at our wonderful personal chemistry. Oh, I love it when you talk like that. Now, have we covered everything? No, but I will have in a minute, my little ice maiden. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew there was something we must discuss. Removing all nuclear warheads from Europe. Absolutely not. You know very well that I won't discuss that unless you comply with the simple conditions that I've outlined. But, Maggie, it's going to be very difficult to completely eliminate socialism from the Russian way of life. In which case, there's nothing more to discuss. But, wait, Maggie, I thought the whole reason for your visit was to make some real progress on the most important issue of our times. And it's worked splendidly. My election prospects have never looked better. <laughs> you always get what you want, my little beetroot. So, if you would like to redeploy yourself on the sofa... Oh, shall I be Czechoslovakia and you can invade me? Da, da. Here comes the big Russian bear. Oh, you <laughs> saucy Soviet. For the most part, politics is a deadly serious business. One's feet must always be planted firmly on the ground... But once in a while, one allows one's mind to wander over what might... No, better make that will happen in the years to come. <laughs> Congratulations, Mrs. Thatcher. Another victory. Yes, just think. Seven election wins on the trial. Yeah. But only four of them as president. If you remember, Geoffrey, I was a mere prime minister for the first three. Oh, oh yes. yes. that was before you instigated the new cabinet system. So sensible to abolish it and install this ultrasonic simulated cabinet feedback synthesizer. Oh. I agree, President. Well, that is what you're programmed to do. I must say, I never expected to be in office in 2007. But, Geoffrey, you've been invaluable. Thank you. Norman and I could never have formed the United States of Europe by ourselves. Oh, I couldn't do it. If we hadn't threatened to send you on round-the-year diplomatic missions, they'd never have surrendered. It's always nice to be helpful. This calls for a celebration. Oh. Uh, Archer, bring the drinks in. Three Chernobyl cocktails coming up. He's such an improvement on the last model we had. Much more human. Now... How about a magnanimous gesture as a mark of congratulation to me? Um, how about giving some of the 15 million unemployed a day off? Oh, don't be frivolous, Herd. They'll all want one. The fact is that elections just don't hold the same excitement since we've vaporised the other parties. You're not thinking of standing down, Margaret. On the contrary, I must continue in office until my job is done. After all, I do have a continent to run. Quite right, Mrs President. Thank you, Cabinet. Thank you. Chapter 4. What could I possibly tell you about Sir Geoffrey Howe that you'd believe? I think it was Dennis Healy who said that debating with him was like being savaged by a dead sheep. I personally never found him to have that much passion and intensity. Hello, Sir Geoffrey Who. Um, oh, well, well, there's been a bit of a how-how. 
who uh, uh, over this Libyan business, hasn't there? I don't know what's going on. Um, Law, read the script in front of you. Oh, yes. Um, on Monday, Margaret called me in for a top-level briefing. So there it is, Geoffrey. Yes. If you can convince the Europeans that they should enforce Libyan sanctions, there won't be any need for bloodshed. In the Middle East? No, among the Europeans. Oh. In the meantime, I'll try with all my might to keep Reagan from using British air bases for a strike against Tripoli. Oh, oh do come away from that window, Geoffrey. Oh, yes, right away, Margaret. Um, what, um, what was that? Oh, nothing, nothing. Oh. Soon after that, I got a visit from some American envoy chappy, um, Eagle Schultweinwert or something like that. Hiya, Jeffrey, old pal, old buddy boy. Hello. Listen, we have positive proof that the pesky Libyans are responsible for acts of terrorism, yes. the failure of a Sunday shopping bill, mm -hmm. the weather, and the reason the 815 from Sutton to Waterloo was cancelled. Really? Who told you that? I'm not prepared to reveal my sources in the interests of security. Why, sir? How long do you think my job will be secure if all my informants got arrested? So I packed my bags and headed off for a high-powered emergency meeting of European foreign ministers. We had to head off a crisis before it got dangerous, and I was the man to do it. There wasn't a moment to lose. Hello, everyone. Oh, Sorry I'm late. Sure. Anybody seen the snapshots of my India trip? It was a particularly lovely one. I've been a rather fetching yellow turban. Look, look. Oh, magnifique. Uh, have you seen my Japanese photo of moi in a kimono? Oh, no. A wonderful shot of me made in Hawaiian lie around my neck. Oh. <laughs> um, what was that? Uh, no idea. Uh, let's issue a statement promising to look hard at some form of Libyan sanctions, shall we? Why? So we can get this meeting over with, and I can show you some pictures of me in a lead hose. Oh. Uh -huh. By the time I got back to Blighty, all hell had broken loose. Sir Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey, 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 what do you think of the American strike on Libya? I think I can firmly say that we should be able to prevent it. But it's happened. Christ, really? Um, uh, of course, I knew all about it, and I'll tell you what I think just as soon as I've talked to the Prime Minister. But Mrs Thatcher says you didn't know. Uh, yes, I cannot say any more in the interest of national security. Sir Geoffrey! So I rushed back to number 10 for a top level briefing. Sorry I'm late, Margaret. Well done, Geoffrey. You've Thank done you. a wonderful job in Europe. But I didn't achieve anything. Maybe, but you made a terrific diversion for us. Yes. Nevertheless, Margaret, I don't think I and Europe are quite in favour of this whole business. Geoffrey, yes. just say that this strike really did lead to the downfall of Gaddafi and terrorism in general. Would you and Europe agree to it then? Well, I suppose... Exactly. I... So we've agreed the terms. We're just haggling over the price. Oh. What, um, what was that? Just come away from the window, Geoffrey. Oh, all right. But the one thing you could say for Sir Geoffrey was that he was always good for playing practical jokes on. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Once upon a time, there was a little boy called Geoffrey. Um, Sir Geoffrey, actually. Who wanted a new suit of clothes. So he went to his wicked stepmother. Mori, Mori on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Not now, Geoffrey. Can't you see I'm busy? But it is important, wicked stepmother. I've got to go to South Africa and I haven't a thing to wear. Very well. Here's a lovely new suit I've bought for you. Oh. Oh, wicked stepmother, thank you. Thank you. Where is it? Now, Geoffrey, this is a magic suit of clothes. <laughs> Most people can see right through it. Yes. It's only visible to my closest friends. Oh. You can see it, can't you? Oh. Um, yes, of course. So little Geoffrey put on his new suit of clothes and went to show his friends. Yes, I <laughs> oh, Geoffrey, uh... No, do like it, Linda. Uh, well... It's a magic suit. Only Margaret's closest friends can see it. Oh, it's, um... It's beautiful, Geoffrey. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Lo love the little dicky. <laughs> <laughs> well, Geoffrey, all set for your trip? Of course, wicked stepmother. Um... But I, I'm a little worried about our um, coloured brothers. They're laughing at my suit already. Couldn't I have just one or two little sanctions to cover my embarrassment? Certainly not, Geoffrey. Mm. Don't worry about them. It's Uncle Pierre who matters, and he's bound to like it. Oh. He's one of my extra special friends. And so, reassured, Geoffrey went to see his Uncle Pierre. Sir Geoffrey, I... 
What do you like it? It's my new suit of clothes. Well, I've heard of coming naked into the conference chamber, but this is ridiculous. He started to laugh. But Margaret <laughs> said you, you were one of her extra special friends. <laughs> And before Sir Geoffrey knew where he was... Lesotho, Basuto and Soweto. The whole world was laughing at him. <laughs> July 1987, and a dark shadow falls across Europe. Oh, get out of the way, Geoffrey. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. Against overwhelming odds, Britain stands alone. The massed grey suits of the EEC stop at nothing to impose their evil will. Reasoned argument, common sense. Their flexibility is almost fanatical. But in this, England's darkest hour, one voice is raised in defiance. We shall fight them on the peaches, we shall fight them in the butter mountains and in the wine lakes. We shall never surrender. Yes, there's no more reassuring sound than the relentless drone of the Grantham bomber as it flies in the face of protocol. Looks like we'll have to bail out, Margaret. No, we've spent far too much already. Oh, well. Meanwhile, in occupied Europe, vast areas are laid waste by the inexorable advance of the ruthless CAP. Desperate struggles are fought over minefields throughout Western Europe. Das ist minefield. Nein, nein, das ist minefield. The end British honor is restored thanks to the never-say-yes spirit of one woman. Never has so much been withheld by so few from so many. Now... Time for my famous V sign. Um, no, M Margaret, no, it's the wrong way round. I know uh, what I'm doing, stupid. As I've said before, I've always enjoyed a close relationship with the leaders of the other two superpowers. They admire and respect my unique brand of advice. Many of the hours I've spent on the phone talking at them. You're through on the hotline to Moscow, Mr. Reagan. Oh, Give you. me that. Oh. Mikhail, this is Margaret. I just happen to be in Washington with the president at the moment. Well, put him on the line, then. Yeah, let me talk to him, Maggie. Come Get on. Off. Now, oh. it's really time you two stopped dragging your feet and made some progress in arms reduction talks. I am prepared to intervene as a go-between. Uh, me, uh, oh. uh, Mikhail, I'll remove all cruise missiles from Western Europe. And I'll abolish all medium and short-range missiles and commit myself fully to the double-zero option. Yeah, Give me that <laughs> phone. <laughs> Now, look here, Gorbachev. Stop stalling. You've sat on the fence for long enough. Look, Margaret, we're trying to negotiate a deal. I'm sorry, Ronnie, but I can't let him get away with it. Look, you're interfering, Dorak. We've already come to an agreement. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, what other stateswoman could have brought you two together? Now, what do you say? Thank, Thank you, you, Margaret. I can't hear you. Loud up. Thank, Thank you, Margaret. Margaret. October 87. I was mortified to find Dennis reading some literature today that had been delivered in a brown paper wrapper. After all these years of marriage, I can't believe he would read such depraved filth. To think that my own husband would bring a copy of Spy Catcher into the house. <laughs> And now we present an extract from the West End's longest-running Whitehall fast. No spy catchers, please. We're British. Bad news about spy catcher, Douglas. What? I've lost it. Well, borrow my copy. No, I mean I've lost the appeal. Which one? The appeal, which is the appeal following the appeal to stop Spike Edger being published in Australia. Oh, dear. What can I do? You could always appeal. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! Oh, no, oh, it's no. Margaret. Whatever you do, don't mention Spike Edger. Yeah. Did someone mention Spike Edger? <laughs> uh, Margaret, sit down. I have something to tell you. You've lost the case, haven't you? I'm appealing. Not to me, you aren't. <laughs> Isn't it about time we gave up this wild goose chase? Give it up? Yes, I mean, why should we spend millions of pounds of taxpayers' money chasing after some rich old has-been from MI5? I didn't know he was rich. He is now. <laughs> He's right, Margaret. After all, everyone's read Spycatcher. I haven't. Have you? Oh, oh, no, 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 of course, course not. not. Good, because it's not worth reading. Oh, I don't know. It had its moments. <laughs> But if we let Wright get away with it, he'll father a whole new generation of traitors. Not if we cut off his pensions. Ooh. 
And no spy catchers, please, where British is now moving to the theater of the absurd. Or you might like to read the book, which is available just about anywhere. In place of the advertised program this evening, we're going over live to Westminster, where the speaker, Bernard Wetherill, is about to open the first televised session of the House of Commons. It's live. Woo! It's new. Woo! It's crazy. It's Bernard's full house. Featuring a host of MPs never before seen in the House of Commons. And your speaker for tonight, the wag with the wig, Bernie Wetherill. Hey, here I am, here I am. Thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Order, order. So many people here since we debated members play. Ah, 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 thank you, thank you. And in election box you tonight. We've got the fascinating, the amazing offshore fishing quotas. We've got an amendment to EEC tariff regulations. But first of all, I'd like to introduce the woman they are calling TV PM, Maggie Sutter. Yeah. Maggie, 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 welcome. Would you like to top the ratings or maybe cap them? Well, Bernard, I'm afraid this lady's not for turning on. <laughs> I'm worried that bringing TV into this historic chamber will just make M MPs play up to the viewers. Camera three, Margaret. But this is my best side. Now, what was I saying? I think... Makeup, that... please. Makeup? Oh, right. Unemployment is well below three million, the economy is booming, and we have a definite plan for the health service. Cut. Got it in one. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you believe that, girl? I know I can't, but what about the opposition? Will TV affect the way they behave? Hey, Neil, come here, come here, come what, here. What, what is it, what is it? Oh, no, it's my partner, Roy. I've got a joke for the viewers, Neil. Oh, yes. What does John Moore read his hospital figures off? I know, a cue card. <laughs> <laughs> a cue card, rock on, Clappy. <laughs> hey, tell the viewers that joke about Lawson's tax cuts, Neil. They won't get it. That was it. Boom, boom. Satire, satire. I've got another one. I say, I say, I say, I will say, I must say, and I shall say. Repetition. Oh, no, it's Ken Livingstone. Put up the red tie. I wish to point out that the activities of a very important body are being covered up. Well, you shouldn't have sat behind Cyril. <laughs> Oh, oh side putting stuff there, side putting stuff here. That side's completely split. Well, let's go out on a musical note, and who better to come up with a little number than the Dave Steele Five? Dave! Well, we're making quite a big name for ourselves, you know, although which name we haven't quite decided yet. So, you and Robert are playing together. I must say, I never expected to see you two in concert. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you're going to play us out, aren't you, Dave? Uh, OK, uh, count us in. Well, that shouldn't take long. One, two, the best part of breaking up is when you're making up. Yes, folks, well, that just about wraps it up tonight. Next week on Bernard's Full House, we've got some great new features for you. There's Parkinson, the late-night chat-up show, plus a new word game for Sheffield MPs, Blunkety Blunk, and rounding off the evening, close down with John Moore. But remember, viewers, it's up to you who appears next time round. If you want to see a new act, it's up to you people at home. After all, it's your vote that counts. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, yes, my love. I'm just up to the point where I feel I ought to sing the praises of those who'd made the greatest contribution to my success. Ah, the advertising charlies. Yes. Now, I can remember one of them was called Saatchi. Yeah. What was the other one's name? The other one? Oh, I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Yes. You? Maybe a drink will help my memory. Oh, 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 oh. Ah, Mr. Saatchi and Mr. Uh, uh, Saatchi, Mum. Ah, yes. yes. Oh, please, don't kneel. Well, Prime Minister, we brought along the brief you requested to help you get out of this awkward little situation with Mr. Lawson. Yes. Well, it's a completely new approach no. for you, Mum. It's uh -huh. fresh, isn't it? It's fresh, it's radical. It's radical, disgraceful. Yeah. Who does Lawson think he is, standing up for himself? He's supposed to be a cabinet minister, for heaven's sake. Still, I, I bet this will fix him good and proper. Let's see it. There you are, Mom. Uh, Have a look at that. Uh, 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 try it out loud, Mom. Uh, see how it sounds. Yeah, see how it sounds. Uh, right. <clears throat> I entirely... I'm sorry. What's that word there? I, 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 I can't quite seem to make it out. Ag... 
Agree. That's it, that's I it, Mom. Keep going. Keep agree. Going. Agree. agree. That's it, yeah. That's it. I entirely agree, agree. with the Chancellor. Oh, I think she's got it. <laughs> right. I entirely agree with the Chancellor. That's it. Oh. I don't know what it means, but it certainly sounds impressive. It does, it does. And you think this will be good for my image? Oh, of course, yes, Mom. Yeah, yes. definitely. It suits you perfectly. Concise, firm, but feminine, and gracious in defeat. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, gracious in what? See, I told you she didn't know the meaning of the word. We proudly present a tale of piracy and blunder on the high seas. Margaret Thatcher as Captain Blighty in Mutiny Over the Bounty. All right, clear the decks, rig the manning, pack the back benches. This day, England expects every man to pay his duty. Replacing the rich, replacing the rich. Hide down, relief. Mr. Tebbit, why aren't those men at their posts? They want to have words with you, Captain. Words? There's no room for discussion on board my flagship. Use the whips to bring them into line. It's no good, Captain. There's trouble brewing. Haven't you seen the signs? Hand me that telescope. Signs? I see no signs. But there's a breakaway group who won't be disciplined, and that's the ringleader. Ahoy there, mate! Aye, Captain. What's this talk of mutiny, you blackguard? Some of the lads aren't happy with this new tax. They reckon it'd be punitive and unfair. No, lads, no. lads, what no. say you to some concessions? Aye, we say they shouldn't have to pay. No. Aye, 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 aye. So aye. be it. A double ration of rum and 115 million for the less well-off, and we'll say no more of it. Uh, but we've seen a paper that says he intend to claw it all back. No Mom. rebates, no rebates. Wait till the press gang get hold of that. The ship's got moles. We've sprung a leak. Captain Rebels on the port side. Shiver me timbers, it's a jolly hassle time. I'm enjoying every moment of it. <laughs> the flagship's been hurled. Abandoned ships, act quickly, act quickly. We're rushing the act through as quickly as we can. Come on. Stand fast, you scurvy sea dogs, or I'll cut you to ribbons. This is a mate. This is a mate. We're losing support at a rate of knots, Captain. Oh, leave them go, Mr. Tevitt. The majority of the crew are still loyal. Set a course for the Lord. Pears to bits! Pears to bits! That's right, me hearties. Now unfurl the sails and full speed ahead. There'll be no point, Captain. For why, Mr. Tebbit? We've just had the wind taken out of them. That's nothing to worry about, you faint hearts. We can still get our flagship into port. Now when I say blow, blow! <laughs> More hot air! I'm a great admirer of the legal system in Gibraltar. They say that justice is blind, but there we made sure it was deaf and dumb as well. Ah. 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 Go up, uh. oh, it's no good. I've never danced like Tommy Steele. Still, at least I've killed that cockroach. Let's put the record on again. Ah. Sir Geoffrey, uh, yes? the coroner in charge of the IRA shootings in quest has just arrived from Gibraltar. Oh, all right, Miss Renshaw, show him up. He's just parking his car. Thank you, Miss Renshaw. Oh, oh. oh, Signor Pizzarello. I was just getting out of my car when three men opened fire at me. Yes, traffic wardens get worse, don't they? Oh. How go the preparations for the inquest? Very well, thank you. Everything's fixed. Oh, good, then. We've got nothing to worry about. I mean the date, the end of June. Uh, aren't you forgetting Gibraltar's famous Festival of Arts? Okay. The end of June Arts Festival. Oh, that. It would only be a drain on the police, so we'll cancel it. What? Cancel Swan Lake, cancel Wagner's Ring Cycle, Ibsen, Molière, Chekhov, Shakespeare? But we only plan to have Julio Iglesias. Shame on you, Signor Pizzarello. Well, can we have the hearing when all that's finished? Uh, no, because I fixed it so that you hold the 2012 Olympics. <clears throat> Let me see if I got this straight. You want me to postpone the hearing ad infinitum in the hope that the witnesses' memories will become blurred? No. Ah. I did it myself four hours ago. Mm, but what do I tell the press? The same as me. All together now. One, two, three. Okay. Eh? I, I know nothing. nothing. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm from, from Barcelona. Barcelona. Very good. Ah. Dennis, ah. what on earth are you doing? I'm trying to work. Uh, just busying myself with my own cabinet reshuffle, darling. Uh, now, gin at the front. And next to the scotch, I think. Now, where shall I put the brandy? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now it's time for the Margaret Thatcher magic show. And here she is, Margaret Thatcher. Thank you, thank you. You're going to like this. Not a lot, but then you've got no choice. In a minute, I'll be showing you my trick shuffle. But first, have a look at this cabinet. 
Thank you, Cecil. What a lovely bikini. Thank you, Margaret. As you can see, there's nothing special about it. It's just a plain, ordinary, hollow cabinet. Now, let's see what we can get out of it. A washing oh. machine. A rotary hedge trimmer. Oh. And last in this series of inanimate objects, John Moore. How did I get here? Moore, here are your cards. Goodbye. Now, let's get on with the shuffle. For my next trick, I require the assistance of a willing volunteer. Mel up! Uh, yes, ma'am. Now, I'm going to put this blindfold on you. Now, this gag. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tie you up, mm -hmm. stick this bag over your head, and lock you in this box. Mm -hmm. Now, show me how you would deal with a sensitive political issue. <laughs> Excellent. Have a job in the health service. Hello, Margaret. <laughs> Look at that. I can make a man appear from nowhere. Hello, Kenneth. Hello. I'd like you to help me with a few tricks. Yes. But first, I'd like you to learn the magic words. Certainly, Margaret. Oh, you know them already. Good. Imagine this deck of cards is a hospital. Now, I'd like you to cut, cut again, and just carry on doing that. A round of applause, please. I said a round of applause, please. Now, let's have a last look at the cabinet. I'll just shake it up again very quickly. Everything's jumbled up in there. Nothing's in its proper place. But if we all say the magic words together just once more... Certainly, Certainly Margaret. And there you are. Everything's back to normal again. Once again, it's just an empty, hollow, ordinary cabinet. Thank you very much. I said thank you very much. Next week, I'm going to make some people's family allowance disappear completely. My press secretary, Bernard Ingham, or as you were saying to me the other day, the man who can't be quoted, has been called many things. Sources close to the Prime Minister, a government spokesman, Sarah Tisdall, Clive Ponting, Leon Britton, amongst others. Perhaps someday, someone will come up with a nice name for him, but I doubt it. Ah, Bernard, yes, I've got something for you to tell the press. Uh, well, I need a pen, madam, or is it simply a matter of gesturing out of the window again? The Independent Broadcasting Authority. Oh, yes, madam. It's independent, it broadcasts, and it undermines my authority. Uh, I'm going to fix it once and for all. I'm bringing in Lord Chalfont. Oh, does it madam think that's wise? He used to be on the other side of the house. He's rather similar to Neil Kinnock in some respects. Oh, don't talk nonsense. Chalfont parted company with the Labour Party in 1967. Yes, he's similar in that respect, too. Oh. Bernard, have you got something against Chalfont for this job? Well, he... Doesn't he have rather close links with the intelligence services? So? And with private investigation services that spy on anti-nuclear campaigners. So? Well, he's a founder member of the media monitoring unit that sees left-wing bias in the weather report. Exactly. And, uh, the IBA is not supposed to be a political appointment. It might not look good. Oh, don't be silly, Bernard. No one will notice. Chalfont is an urbane, civilised man who can pass as normal in almost any situation. Ah, oh, that'll be him now. Good morning. The name's Chalfont. Lord Chalfont. And I suppose he's licensed to kill. Franchised, Bernard. The word is franchised. January 1989. Kenneth Baker must be on drugs. He had the nerve to criticise my policy towards the arts. I mean, what does he know about the classics? Maybe he is steeped in ancient Greece. I think you'll find that's just his hair, old girl. Oh, oh Margaret, not that my trousers. Oh. oh, Gosh, Baker, I feel so excited. Uh. I think I can feel one of my initiatives coming on. Oh, God. Yes, I've solved the litter problem, sorted out football hooligans, cleaned up the environment. Uh. What else do you think I should bequeath to a grateful nation? Something that demonstrates my... Clarity of vision and depth of spirit. Um, how about supermarket trolleys? You know, the way they always veer off to the side. Mm, yes, not bad, but yeah. I was thinking, what about the arts? I haven't done anything about them yet. You certainly haven't. Pardon? Um, you certainly haven't had such a good idea for a long time, Margaret. Why don't I get the Minister for Arts up here and... Uh, but who is he, by the way? Um, we have got one, haven't we? Oh, yes, yes, Prime Minister, bound to have. Uh, oh, isn't it that... Um, What's his name? You know, the, the uh, vacuous non-entity. Which one? Oh, never mind. I'll appoint someone else. What's Tebbit doing at the moment? No, 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 Margaret. No, no, you couldn't. Uh, he doesn't know the difference between page three and the titian. What? He's an artist, Margaret. Really? 
He doesn't by any chance paint those lovely blue ladies Dennis gets from W.H. Smith, does he? No, he doesn't, Prime Minister. Oh, pity. I've always liked those. And music. Yes. We must do something about that. You know, I listened to Radio 3 the other day and it was so depressing. Sure it wasn't the cricket commentary? Really, Baker, I can tell the difference between Brian Johnston and Ludwig von Tchaikovsky, you know. I never realised you had such a thorough understanding of music. Though. I'll have you know, I've got every record Mantovani ever made. What about Grand Opera? We mean Lloyd Webber, that sort of thing. Uh, so, that's painting and music sorted out. What else is there? Uh, literature? Well, I did see Pygmalion by Shakespeare once. Sure. Yes, I'm bloody positive. Mm -hmm. But I think we can leave literature to Geoffrey and Douglas, don't you? Perhaps they can get together with a few other great novelists, say, uh, Frederick Forsyth and, and Leslie Thomas. Uh, Margaret, this is the country that produced Dickens, Austen, the Brontes. We'll ask them to come along, too. Oh. Oh, cheer up, Kenneth. I know you're disappointed, but don't worry. We can move on to supermarket trolleys next week. Now then, what would I need? Um, sun hat, Bermuda shorts, something to save my skin. Oh, Chernan, what the hell are you doing here? What? Uh, uh, just looking over these important papers, Prime Minister. Yes, but apart from drooling over those holiday brochures, didn't you get my note? You mean that one marked most urgent? I, I didn't think it was important. After all, I get hundreds of letters like that every day. Chernan, you blithering idiot, it's about your performance over the Pan Am warning. You've been accused of misleading the House. Gosh, thank you, Prime Minister. It's not a compliment, Chernan. You were asking for trouble going through the Nothing to Declare channel in the Commons. I mean serious misrepresentation of facts. That's only supposed to happen in the Ministry of Employment and Health and Environment. Anyway, tell me what actually did happen, if that's possible. Well, I told the House I didn't pass on the warning because the document forbade me to do so and that the United States authorities had said it was a hoax, which was fine up to a point. What point? Uh, until somebody released the document and it became apparent that it said nothing of the kind. Oh, it's no good, Sharon. You'll have to do the expected thing. OK, I'll deny it all. No, 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 no. How can we put it? Oh, apologise. Uh, I didn't suppose you... Oh, it's hardly my forte, Shannon. But try making a statement to the Commons where no one will notice. Like after the first reading of the water bill? Splendid. And let this be a warning to you, Shannon. I want you to come in tomorrow morning and make a completely fresh start. I'm sure you're going to enjoy working with Nicholas Ridley. Righto. I'll be off in a minute. I'm just waiting for the last post. Don't worry. You'll be hearing it any day now, Shannon. Over the decade, many political commentators have tried to pinpoint the exact reason for my continued success. Usually, they put it down to the ineptitude of the opposition parties. What complete and utter nonsense. It was sheer, downright incompetence. It is with trembling voice, deep emotion, a tear in the eye, and other symptoms of stress that we name Margaret Hilda Thatcher our Woman of the Decade. As the first ten years of her reign draw to a close, we review the many achievements of our glorious leader, the inventive, resourceful way she has dealt with the unemployment figures, her commitment to free health care, whatever the cost, and her policy of allowing British industry to be owned by all, regardless of nationality. In this golden decade, the Iron Lady has constantly proved her mettle, brazenly flogging the family silver to an electorate all too easily led. As Prime Minister, she has shown herself the passionate champion of minority groups, especially the 40% who voted her in. Her opponents can only run round in circles and then retreat helplessly before her, like the General Belgrano. Her education policy is proof that a little learning has to go a long way, and in an age of mud-slinging election campaigns, she has demonstrated great restraint on radio, on television and on the press. Those in the party around her are always fired with enthusiasm. She was particularly keen to get rid of Pym, Carrington, Heseltine and Britain, but surely her greatest triumph is her monetary policy. Inflation levels bearing witness to the old adage that... What goes up must go higher. That's why we name Margaret Hilda Thatcher our Woman of the Decade. Surprise! Surprise! Oh, how marvellous! A surprise! 
surprise party for our 10th anniversary. We don't know what to say. Sweet, sweet, oh, sweet. Oh, no, 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 we couldn't possibly. And did those feet in ancient times... Very well, Geoffrey, even... if you insist. We should like to thank personally all those who have made this momentous occasion possible. Oh, it was nothing really, Margaret. Nothing. But unfortunately, General Galtieri, Neil Kinnock and Arthur Scargill don't appear to be here tonight. Uh, no, don't worry, Norman. She won't have forgotten us. And we'd also like to thank all those who have stood by us through the good times and the bad, the thick and the thin. There, yeah, what did I tell you? Now, everybody enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Heaven knows we shall. Uh, <laughs> wonderful yeah. speech, Margaret. Yes. I'm overcome with emotion. Here are some messages from those who unfortunately couldn't attend tonight. Oh, how kind. Let me see now. Oh, there's one from Pim, Biffin, Hesseltine, all saying roughly similar things. Oh, they shouldn't have. I know, that's why they went in the first place. Anyway, if you'd like to step this way, we have one last surprise for you. Yeah. Norman? Right. Uh, as you can see, Margaret, we've arranged a live video link-up. Mm -hmm. And any second now, messages of goodwill should be pouring in from all over the country. All over the country. <laughs> any second now, <laughs> please. <laughs> ah, here's one coming soon. <laughs> Chris, oh, uh, Comrie, Margaret, Peter Walker here. I I'm actually at the Vale of Glamorgan. Sorry about the noise. Get off, get off. Uh, Labour victory party. Yeah, we seem to have lost it. I mean... Uh, uh, well, um, never mind. Come on, everybody, drink up. Oh. There's plenty more for everyone. Oh. Bubbly, Margaret? We were when we arrived, Geoffrey. Uh, don't worry, Margaret. It's nothing more than a mid-term slump in popularity. I mean, you've had it before. Geoffrey, I think you've drunk rather too much. Well, whatever you do mean, Margaret. Well, this is the first mid-term I've ever celebrated. Oh. oh, by the way, did I show you this marvellous anniversary gift from Dennis? No. I believe it's called an eternity ring. Hello and welcome to the Thatcher Factor. With me tonight I have one of the country's top economists who will be trying to sum up the feeling in Britain after ten years of Margaret Thatcher. Professor. 